Well, hello, so nice to see everyone. Uh, my name is Tracy. I'm joined by uh, Koma, my colleague. Uh, we both work with Coach Aria, and we're both right now currently located in Toronto, Canada, which is a treat because normally we're in different places <laughs> at the same time. But uh, yeah, really excited to see you here and to uh, explore this together. Um, and I uh, want to just encourage everyone, this is an interactive section session. <laughs> it's, uh, it's all about reflection and reflective dialogue. So um, would love to really, really encourage you all to um, feel free to share as much as you um, are inspired to do so. Um, it'll be a really dynamic conversation if we are able to hold it as a conversation. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to invite Komal to say hello. I'll just, uh, I'll say just a couple words about myself briefly. <laughs> um, I am um, an associate trainer with Coach Aria. I also work with them on, uh, on standards and I'm a coach, of course, and I'm also a meditation teacher. But these are all uh, callings that I found relatively late <laughs> in my life. <laughs> oh, up until five years ago, I was the opposite of reflective, I would say. Um, and it has been a real gift for me to go along the journey. And I think reflection has really, really um, enabled me to make some deep and lasting changes in my life. And so I'm really excited about talking that about that with you, partly because I just made a move and I feel like everything kind of turned on its head and I haven't been super reflective lately. So I was telling Komal today, this is a gift because it reminded me of why um, it's important to do so. So um, yeah, just wanted to share that with you and Komal, I would love for you to just uh, say hello as well. Hi, hello everybody. Uh, like Tracy mentioned, I am uh, Komal and uh, I am also an associate trainer with Coach Arya. And uh, me and Tracy, we've spent good time together learning and exchanging and reflecting jointly as well, <laughs> which has been a beautiful journey, which brought us more closer together and, uh, you know, find our own spaces of learning and sharing with each other. And um, I am from India, but now I'm based in um, Toronto, Canada. And um, I've been a global mobility professional for 14 years before I came into coaching as, as a full-time professional. Um, I'm a mom and I absolutely love uh, what I do. It Like Tracy said, that she's found her calling. For me, also coaching is more like a calling. It's... it's uh, a journey and a purpose as well, all together. And I'm happy to be again in this space with you, Tracy, <laughs> to reflect <laughs> together with everybody. I wanted to um, invite you all, if you haven't already, um, to uh, have like a pen and some paper or journal nearby, because we're gonna have some opportunities for reflection here. Um, so just if you need to, to do that, please feel free to go ahead. And um, yeah, maybe we can start by talking about uh, what reflection means to you. So for me, reflection is about pausing um, and kind of disconnecting from what might be present to um, integrate, uh, past experiences, learning to better understand maybe what is going on uh, in the present. Um, so it's definitely a pause and connection time. I like what Susan said. I find that there's different forms of reflection. And if I do a journal entry on things that I'm learning, which I just finished a program, and I found that that was just one way of me reflecting what I've learned and what I thought of, of, of it. But the other types of reflection is when I do pause 
and the world is closed off. It's like a form of meditation. So I was studied as a Reiki master and often go to that if I really want the peace in my head to stop spinning. Um, but if a reflection, it might just be sitting with a cup of tea and being very mindful and just doing something completely not working wise. So for me, that causes times for a reflection and sometimes I'm not aware of it until the answer pops into my head. So I think there's different ways of doing it. Um, so it's not, you know, if I do this, then this happens. If I do this, then this happens. It's not like that. It's just whatever comes in and then I might get the answer, might not. And it's like a lot of people, when you go to sleep with the problem, you wake up with the answer when you're having the show. So, so there's all sorts of different ways. So I find it very powerful and encourage um, clients and family and friends to take that time out to stop the noise. I actually love your comment, Eileen, about stopping the noise because I think that, you know, that's a big part of my experience as well. Um, but for me, I think it's a way of life. Like I, I actually wrote diaries about 20 years every day um, and, and almost you know, sometimes it was just verbal diarrhoea. Other times I'd have a dialogue with, you know, my brain. So, you know, that sort of thing, that, that was really helpful. But I also um, you know, worked on a lot of project teams. I think Lessons Learnt is vastly underrated and one of the most highest contributing. Uh, as a coach, every time I exit someone from an organisation, I'll do it, you know, reflection time as well. So sometimes it's dialogue. For me, you know, sometimes it's with a pen. Uh, other times it's with people. So some of my friends know that, you know, <laughs> there'll be calls and there'll be chats. Uh, and I think, you know, whenever it's in a group, if I can have my introvert time first to get my ideas into some sort of order, um, that's probably a better quality reflection than the um, stream of consciousness, but I do both. I, I agree with Eileen. I think there are different forms. For me, it's often a slowing down, you know, and, and a, you know, it can be um, amusing about and following the thoughts and, as I'm doing something else, you know, and, and like you, Arlene, you're not always conscious of this, but I think there's conscious reflection too where I do focus, and, and that for me is a great source of learning because you're looking at things from different perspectives. So I suppose in a way it's kind of analytical, but it's really looking at the thoughts and, and what they mean. So it's meaning-making for me. I first came to reflection because years ago I used to be a nurse and we used to do um, reflective practice. Um, now it, it sometimes it's a really deep consideration of things and I've just started training as a coach. I'm already a mentor and at the moment we're, we're thinking about sort of reflection in terms of, of being a coach and clients and Sort of reflective models and that kind of thing and also um, sometimes it's light touch my when my dog was young I used to take him for really long walks and I used to think to myself a lot of problems can be solved behind his tail and things just used to come into my mind almost unconsciously so for me there's various kinds of reflection in various situations and also when I mentor then often I both with a light touch think about because I'm taking on the new reverse mentee and I'm every so often thinking about that relationship and where it might go although I've got no concrete ideas at the moment and so I think if you've got a relationship with a mentee or when I start getting coaches it's most important to reflect on that. And sometimes it's, it's what comes into your mind at the time. I, for those that have joined, we're speaking about what uh, reflection means to each of us. And I just wanted to say that um, what's so beautiful about this is that there's so many differences and yet so many common themes amongst all of you, <laughs> you know, like I'm hearing that um, each person has these different practices that depend, you know, that they're, they're accessing depending on what the needs are, depending on, um, 
you know, like whether it's a stream of consciousness that needs to happen or whether it's a pause. And Roz, what you said about, I'm going to remember that I have a dog as well. <laughs> so the answer's coming from behind your dog's tail. That's absolutely so lovely. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's really, really interesting exploring this with you because I think the beauty about reflection is that it's going to be very individual for each of us, right? Um, but very intentional. And um, I'd love to invite anyone else that wants to jump in and share. And maybe Koma, you can speak to uh, your reflective practice as well, and then I'll I'll share. Yeah. So for me, uh, like you said, and the word you've used, intentional that reflection is a very, very intentional practice and one where we intentionally and consciously put ourselves or, or the self as we know in our everyday life at a distance and, you know, look and bring ourselves into a very, very objective space to, to look at something from, from a completely different uh, layer or a completely different space from when we've been involved in certain action or everyday life. So, so Femi, reflection is is just bringing ourselves intentionally to that space, and and it can happen in either ways. It can happen in a walk, or it can happen in sitting in silence and taking pause, or for me, most of the times it, it happens while I'm cooking or while I'm talking to my children as well, because they help me bring out of that, that space where I normally am. So it's like distancing from whatever we need to reflect on or whatever we need to understand from a different aspect. So that's how reflection happens for me. I like what you raised there about the distancing. And I think that's similar to what I heard earlier about the, um, the slowing down as well, right? Like there has to be a level of space between not only what's happening, but the way that we're perceiving it in that moment. Yeah. I'm uh, currently in uh, Sydney, Australia, otherwise from Croatia, Vedrana. And uh, I've been um, coach and mentor and now in the training for being a supervisor, psychology, psychotherapy background, but also yoga teacher for many, many years. And the meditation is part of my uh, daily sadhana routine. And uh, I, I, I distinguish between two uh, different eh, so all is reflection, basically, but being alone, doing whatever, vacuum cleaning or uh, washing dishes and uh, having this space inside and repeating my mantra is more of reflection who I am. So I don't need to sit in meditation and be there in that whenever that activity or just walking, whenever something like <laughs> where I don't need my brain a lot then I'm with myself in the topic of who I am in the universe, what's my purpose of, as a human. And uh, um, active, uh, intentional reflection uh, regarding any issue, um, challenge, and uh, relationship with the supervisee or coachee or um, any other partner, client, huh? that's what I then try to do it, um, how, how I was trained in my uh, coaching pre uh, education, according to Kolb's learning circle, like what's happened and uh, how I felt, what I thought, what were the reasons for that? Is it similar to any other situation of my life? So to find like common denominator or a pattern or something. And what's the insight I'm gaining here? And uh, how knowing that I could act 
differently in the future or think differently in the future and in what particular situations. So this is how we were actually trained. And I, I pretty much resonate with that Kolb circle because it's just so natural. And then often I write it down so to remind myself next time when I look at it, <laughs> I can revise if I did it if I made the change and if not, then I reflect again and make some other notes in, in that journal. Yeah, something like this. Yeah, we'll be talking a little bit about Kolb's and um, it's such a rich practice because, you know, we were talking a bit about um, intention, right? <laughs> and I find that when we approach reflection as a cycle of learning, <laughs> then it really brings so much intention into our actions. And I thought maybe we could explore that. Like, what does it do when we know that we're going to be reflective about something? <laughs> what does it bring in terms of some of the decisions that we're making over the course of the day? I know for myself, um, and one of the... the <laughs> Like, like I said, even this webinar is such a gift for me because it's reminded me and one of the programs that I run is, is it's called, uh, it, it doesn't matter, but it's, it's about mindfulness and we talk about intention, right? And I found that to be so wonderful because it's caused me to reflect on what energy do I want to be coming from? <laughs> you know, what within myself do I want to be accessing today? And then in the moments where I'm, you know, not <laughs> quite there, I, it sometimes serves as a little bit of a reminder of like, oh yeah, you were going to be coming from compassion or patience <laughs> because, you know, at one point it was compassion that I was working on. And then I realized what's coming in the way of my compassion is my patience, you know? And so it serves in a way to almost prime <laughs> the, the cycle of reflection when we start thinking about it in terms of approaching it with an intention. To add to that, when you what said, I, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Susan, please. Yeah, what that kind of triggered for me is the recognition of the ability to slow down and disconnect, right? So it's one thing to say, to have a reflective practice and to be intentional about it. And, and what I'm aware of is all the work I've done over time and the, and the commitment to a morning meditation is that slowing down, the disconnecting from kind of the mental um, movement, mental chatter, you know, the analysis of uh, things that need to get done, you know, commitments that needed to be, you know, fulfilled, right? So that when you talk about patience and when you talk about kind of that, it's, it's the recognition that for me, reflection is about strengthening learning and increasing insight, right? But if we don't know how to slow that down, right, um, to, to be able to allow for the insight to present itself and the patience to hear it and the ability to kind of shift our energy from a place of um, maybe um, hyper analytical, you know, drive energy to energy that is more present, which is more calm, clear, and available to self and others. And so that's what I'm reminded of is, is the discipline of a reflective practice. In a way, in a way, Susan has said what was in my mind, <laughs> what I was about to say is that when you know that, you know, that you're going to be reflective after a, a certain activity, it, it becomes a certain level of awareness when you are in the process so you're not just rushing through it, but you're more aware and, and you are acting from a space or you're being in a space which is which is much more conscious, I would say. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, you know, I loved the, um, what you shared about energy there, Susan, because I think that that is, um, so intuitive in a sense, right? Because it's not, it, then it doesn't become about cognition. It's not like where you're, you're stopping in the moment and then thinking about <laughs> what you should do. And then that should comes in, right? And, and that should is never very reflective, but it's rather like, who do I, not even who do I want to be, but like, what, what do I want to embody in this moment? <laughs> right? Um, what do I want to be manifesting? So yeah, I think that's, that's really, really beautiful. And I wanted to ask you because it kind of leads really well into um, the important thing about intention, because we can set all the intentions that we want, right? But we really need to pay attention <laughs> in our interactions and in our, in our behaviors and in, in our day-to-day -day living. Um, as to how those intentions are, of what intention are we coming from? And so I thought maybe we, we could talk about like, what are some of the ways that you are able to do that? Like I've heard you talking about the slowing down and, 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 and the distancing and all of those things. And those are all really powerful, but what prompts you, <laughs> you know, I'd love to, can we explore what it is that sort of in the moment creates that opportunity for paying attention for you. Can yes. I? Yes. Um, I'm actually uh, always, when, when I start talking about reflective uh, practice and reflective space, I always think about me uh, as an addict to action. I come to coaching myself uh, over like a decade ago because I was so... Um, addicted to results and action and so on. So that, that, that was my journey into coaching as a client. Then I started becoming coach myself. And I remember that when my mentors and supervisors invited me to slowing down, like creating this reflective space in journaling, uh, it was very hard for me to understand what they really want me to do because it was just, yeah, I was doing, doing it what makes sense. Yeah, I was brought up this way. But I found... Luckily and accidentally, I found a way to express it uh, through art. And for me, art is the way I can organize my thoughts in a different manner because as a typical doer, action-oriented person, I have a tendency to be over-analytical and over-logical. But in the process of creating uh, art, uh, something like uh, writing poetry or you know, even, uh, like even using the words to, to set the scene of what's going to happen or some kind of um, flow of unconscious uh, words in a journal. But it, it has the form of art. I perceive it as a, more as an art, as journaling. It helps me to find the things which I wouldn't normally have access to. Because, you know, I'm, like everything what I do is probably over uh, taken by my prefrontal cortex. So logic, 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 analytical, 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 action, action, action. And so if I create the space of art for myself, and I think that this is the moment when I, for example, read poetry or read something which I consider artistic or watch movies and then think about it, um, then helps me a lot. And I actually notice that I have a tendency when I prepare myself to be a client of supervision or I supervise my supervision as well, that I very often write poems about that. That is it's the way I create the space. Because normal actions like meditation or something, it's, it, uh, it's so far from my, um, how to say, so far from the habit I developed a long time ago that it's almost hard to be broken. So... That's the signal that if I go from the logical to artistic to metaphorical, that's the space for me to reflect. You mentioned that, and and I poetry is something I know that Komal does, but it's recently been something that I've started doing when I'm finding, <clears throat> and I, I I try to intentionally explore my emotions a lot, but sometimes when they're really really thick and and, and sticky and difficult. <laughs> I, I can really get stuck in it and it doesn't feel like there's movement. And there's been a few times that I've actually just sat and, and started writing. Um, 
I guess it's a form of poetry <laughs> about it. And it, it it's all sort of talking about the textures and 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 the um the intricacies of the emotions that I'm experiencing. And I've actually found that that to be a really powerful way <laughs> to reflect on it, even though like, I think anyone that would read it, it wouldn't make sense to. So I just, I, I thought that that was so lovely that you said that because in a sense, reflection can really be abstract as well, right? I think we think of the fact that we need to make sense all the time. <laughs> And, you know, when you say that, Tracy, I just can't help myself bringing a, 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 this aspect of thinking. When early on, I always had this habit of self-talk. And it was like, you know, I'm going through my every day and then there comes a certain time in my day or in my week when I just get into this self-talk mode automatically. And, and I have to, it's like I'm drawn to the self-talk and then that self-talk will happen. And then after a time I'll realize, hmm, I'm just talking to myself. And when I'm alone, I can talk out loud to myself. You know, that was the sort of self-talk. And after a, a long time, after many, many years, I realized that that was a way of my reflection. You know, that was me reflecting upon all my experiences or whatever I have gone through or whatever I've experienced, because that self-talk in a way would be very uh, resolving. It would it would eventually help me resolve. But I didn't realize it back then that that was my way of reflection. And because I didn't realize, but still it was pulling me, it, it makes me think and I could be absolutely just making it up and it's it's out there for you to reflect upon is that reflection is is a, is a basic requirement whether we actively pursue it in in a certain way or not but reflection is a part of us and in some way or other we always reflect whether we are aware of it or not like i wasn't aware of my self talk to be my reflective practice back then now i do not need it that much because i consciously sort of reflect and journal or do a whole lot of other things but that's what I, I thought of it. So in a sense, when we're not consciously reflecting, we're unconsciously <laughs> doing it. And, and, and it makes me think, cause I think I was doing that as well, but in the past, and I mean, I still do, I, I still do, <laughs> but um, it tended to be more ruminating, you know, like I would have a lot of rumination and I found, I find that I wanted to explore that with you. Do you sense that the movement of reflection kind of takes it out of that? Because the ruminating space means that it tends to, there's a movement, but sometimes that movement is just going around and around, right? <laughs> and the reflective space allows us to kind of put it out here and then literally reflect it back to us, to ourselves. You know, there's a learning that can happen. Yeah, um, Tracy, I, I I would agree with that because I've been thinking um, of my own practice, and when I hit the journal, that's when I have to stop the ruminating. It's like it's time to address it. So it's been going right in my head with no solutions. It's becoming um, it's not so much the solution, but it's becoming annoying. You know, to say so the pen comes up and start writing. So in the way that, you know, people write poetry, I just start telling the story on the paper, where it's going, what I feel, you know, and, and it, it brings me to an answer. My journaling is not that frequent. I'm not disciplined to do it every day. Um, but I feel there's a call. And when you were talking about intention earlier, it comes to the surface and it just has to be addressed because a lot of the time I'm better talking things out either with a peer or in my, in my own head to say, well, that's not going to work. So what's going to work? Um, 
or with a supervisor, you know, when, when, when I have that time. But the time is not always available with a supervisor. So that's when the pen hits the book and you start doing that. Um, and, I, and I like the idea of poetry because I, in a personal life um, aspect, I had a couple of issues and I thought, you know, my daughter said, why don't you just write it down? And I got a frustration out by just creating a very short poem of what it was that I was going through. So when that situation comes up, I re remember the poem that I wrote and what the conclusion was. So, so I think there's different ways for different people. So I don't think there's one set, but I think when, you, when it's an intention for me, when it's at the surface, there's a reason to do something about it. So whatever works for you, whether it's painting, poetry, um, writing uh, as a prose and finding the answer, I think that that's very powerful, um, as well as doing other things, which is talking to you. So I talk to myself a lot. I talk, <laughs> talk to my dog. <laughs> you know, I recently acquired a dog, and I love that one about following the tail. <laughs> it's just I'm never going to look at her tail in the same way again, but yeah, I, I think there's different ways of getting to where we want to get to. That's so beautiful. And you know what? It's really important, I think, even to remember um, for ourselves and also our clients or anyone that we're interacting with, because I think that sometimes people feel like reflection has to be about journaling, you know, and if somebody doesn't like to journal and they feel like um, I'm not reflective, <laughs> I, I, you know, that doesn't work for me. And yet we've heard so many different ways of, of reflection here. Right. Um, and even like what you said about talking, I, I haven't had my dog as close to me lately because I'm in Toronto staying uh, in a building that doesn't have take dogs. And, um, I'm realizing that I think <laughs> I've been suffering a little because I do the same. I speak out loud to her all the time <laughs> and it gives me the opportunity to, um, to reflect a little bit in just through my conversation with her, just having these words coming out of my mouth. Yeah. Tracy, somehow I got attached to this um, vision you created of the rumination as the circle and the reflection is something different, like I don't know, the flow, the, the, the river, the path going going forward. And I think this is a very powerful metaphor. That's what logic sometimes does, or analytical thinking is going like or deeper, like but going in this way. And there are a lot of shoots and you know, have tools in the thinking like that, or I should have done something different, or so, or so on. But when we have this kind of movement like flow, it always into the future, so it, it leads us from now, for experiencing now, into the future somehow. So there is uh, the power of getting unstuck, and I, I, I love this image. I, I haven't thought about it, but now it's going to stay with me, yeah? like ruminating, reflection. Yeah, and what you said about moving into the future is going to stay with me. Thank you, because I hadn't thought about it that way, but that's that's really powerful. Yeah. And, you know, it was actually just today that I was ruminating <laughs> and I, and I thought to myself, okay, I'm, I'm, I, I said you, cause I speak to myself as if I'm the second person, but I'm like, you're choosing to be stuck at this moment, you know? <laughs> and just the fact that I was able to identify that I was making that choice <laughs> helped me kind of unstick myself. Yeah. I thought maybe we can try a little activity together. Um, and then maybe talk a little bit more just about the learning cycle, because I think that that, um, that could be a powerful conversation. But if you're all up for it, maybe we can do just a little, a little journaling activity. Um, and maybe we can start off with just kind of, this is going to be around um, a situation that's come up that maybe we have a feeling around, right? So I don't want it to be anything that's too um challenging or traumatic or you know anything like that this is more as a curious exercise than it is a uh one that's gonna leave you feeling poorly but i think it, it can still be powerful um so maybe just we can start off by taking a moment and 
you know, um, and, and feel free if you prefer to go off camera for this, but maybe just taking a moment and either like closing the eyes or finding a soft gaze, maybe taking them off the screen though. And just coming to the space of the breath, finding it at the nostrils. And just centering on the breath for a moment, feeling it flow in and out of the body, noticing the rise and the fall of the chest. Noticing the bottom where it meets the seat beneath you and the feet on the ground. The hands wherever they're placed. Just shifting the shoulders down a little. And from this centered, stable space, just bringing into mind a situation that came up that might still feel a little bit challenging or just have some emotion around it. And just allowing that situation to surface and your thoughts about it to become present to them. Noticing if there's an emotion that is attached to those thoughts. And sitting with that for a moment and exploring it. Maybe just seeing if there's a label that describes the emotion. And then whatever it is, naming it. And saying to ourselves here, I am, and then whatever the emotion is. So if it's frustrated or sad, just saying, I am sad, I am frustrated. And repeating those words to yourself in your head. Seeing what happens here to the body, the thoughts, to the feelings about the situation itself. And just noticing that curiously. And then shifting the relationship to the emotion just a little. Saying to ourselves, I feel angry, sad, whatever it happens to be. I'm repeating that a couple of times. I'm just sensing into the body, seeing how the experience of feeling that is does it change the thoughts or the perception of the situation and then Inviting another little exploration of the relationship with this emotion. Saying to ourselves, I am aware of feeling whatever it is. And just repeating that a couple of times and seeing what happens. to the sensations in the body or the relationship with the thoughts or the situation. 
I am aware of feeling this emotion. Just allowing whatever comes up to come up. And then inviting one more shift. My awareness, sorry, <laughs> awareness knows. And then whatever name that emotion is. So from the awareness that you are, Awareness knows and name the emotion. And then invite it in. Allow the awareness to know the emotion and to actually welcome it. It's here, it's a part of the experience. What happens when we can open up to that? Allow it to be and welcome it. I'm just taking a moment with the question and whatever answers are there, whatever sensations, feelings. And then coming back to the feeling of the feet on the ground and the hands on the body, the breath traveling in and out of the nostrils, opening the eyes whenever you're ready, and then maybe taking the journal and a pen and taking a couple moments just to write about whatever came up there or draw. Just reflect a little longer. We'll just spend two minutes doing that. Is there anyone that want, has anything that uh, they feel inspired to share? I do. Um, for me, it. I'm not sure how effective it was, partially because I'm in London and in my time zone, it's quarters to one and I don't usually get up at this time. But what I'm for my coaching course, thinking about personal effectiveness, which is something I find quite hard. And I'm thinking about conflict management, like it just in the day to day, like not arguing with people that smoke in my flats and that kind of thing. And which I find very difficult. And the the whereas the at the moment I'm just trying to walk past and say, well, there's other ways of dealing with this than direct conflict. But in this situation, I felt very calm and relaxed, which is not what I would feel tomorrow, like if I see somebody. And also at one point I used to meditate a lot in the Buddhist tradition. And what happened to me is I went straight into meditation mode and in fact it made it really hard for me to think about the issue that I was thinking about because I just felt really relaxed so I think that I didn't really do the exercise properly at all but it, it did kind of it, it help it, it was different to think about um, both personal effectiveness and managing conflict in a completely relaxed and in a fashion where I was just meditating and that was more like I was 96% meditating and about 4% considering the issue. So I don't know whether you'd call that a success or not. That's a, you know, what came up for me, and I guess if we let go of success or, or failure, like it sounded like you were in a situation where you were able to find space from something that hasn't necessarily been available to you um, at other times and considering that is, is 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 that kind of what I'm hearing 
Um, in, in reflective terms, it enabled me to take that really put distance in between me and the issue, which has been very difficult to do. And yeah, as a tool for creating distance, it really hit the spot basically. And that to be able to be really relaxed in considering it. But I, I was kind of biased by the fact that I used to meditate a lot and my, my head strip went straight into that mode. And I'm used in the Buddhist tradition, you try and clear your mind. So I, in a way, I was doing two conflicting things at the same time. But uh, as you quite rightly say, that really enabled me to put an immense amount of distance between the issue and me, which was very helpful. And I think when I'm thinking about it uh, going forward, it will help me put distance between me and the issue. And that might really help with like dealing with it as it crops up, so to speak, which will be really useful. Thank you. I also felt starting from a very heavy feeling to going to absolute lightness by the end of it. And it seems to me what you were speaking earlier about ruminating to reflecting, that's precisely sort of, it, it's shown a pathway. Like when I say that I am tired and disappointed, that's my ruminating place because I am in it with it. So, so everything is sort of absorbed and nothing is getting reflected or no reflection is happening. And then gradually a sort of shift happens and you go into that reflective space where, you, where you're not holding or carrying anything. It's just awareness, knowing about, you know, what is happening. And so whatever that heaviness was that sort of lifted, and even if it began from me feeling disappointed, by the end of it, I could feel, feel a sense of joy still lying underneath whatever was being reflected on. So, so I think that sort of showed up for me. It's really actually amazing. I love what you just said about finding the joy underneath, because I think like our feelings and our emotions are so layered and nuanced, right? <laughs> but when we're kind of wearing one and, and, and walking around the world and embedded in it, <laughs> then we're, we're not sensing what else is there, right? Like when I'm feeling like, frustrated or stressed like that stress is something that like I feel like I put that hat on and I wear it for days in a row sometimes <laughs> and then I'm not finding the joy I'm not finding the other things that are also in my experience yeah I I, I think what is powerful about this is is in a sense <laughs> it's really shifting our observation right? From being the subject of something to looking at it objectively. And also, I remember one of the most powerful things that I need to come back to again and again, it's from Krishnamurti, <laughs> but it was from uh, Truth is a Pathless Land, and he talked about conflict being the op wanting the opposite of what is, right? So when we're feeling something and, you know, like it's really rare that we're going to be inclined to feel like stress is welcome, <laughs> but when we're feeling stressed and we're feeling in conflict of it, then we're creating a whole other layer of challenge <laughs> within our experience, right? And so by simply opening up and acknowledging something that is already there for us, it really gives us the opportunity to um, create a level of movement. <laughs> Even if that thing is moving with us, <laughs> right? Yeah, so because I, I noticed that when we went to the fourth statement, there was, there was a sort of very natural acceptance of, okay, whatever it is, it is. And it's, it's not in here or it's not sort of attached to me in a way and so so that sense that sense of acceptance or allowance of 
it is there and let it be, you know, then there is no force coming from within me to try and push it away or try to get rid of it. So, so, so there is no, and, and probably that is what sort of created so much of lightness and so much of a sense of peace or joy uh, to come with it. So Tracy, um, I did feel the same as uh, Kamal is saying about the light changed and then becoming aware of it and it's okay to sit with it. And mine was frustration and it's frustration relating to a client. And it's almost like I, I felt towards the end, I started to see, well, there's a wall, but whose wall is it? Is it her wall? Is it my wall? Is it her frustration or my frustration? Is my frustration impacting on her? Am I subconsciously reflecting that frustration that we're not making progress or is she frustrated with my process? So, but I was calm about it because then acknowledging the frustration and where it could be, then it's an opening for the next session with her is to say where she is and the barriers and not make assumptions, but just to test some of those images that came up for me um, because I feel um, I feel there's a sense of that progression um, is uh, it's stuck. We we we've gone back and forth on the same issues, and I think there might be a barrier there. But I need to test that with her now. Um, but the, the this exercise helped me just to be calm about it and say, Eileen, what are you projecting? to this client, if you're sensing the frustration, whose frustration is it? Thank you. I, you know, it's, as you said that, I was thinking that like, and, and Komal sharing as well, like there's something to the progression, right? Because we're first of all transitioning. The first step is we're transitioning out of the story. So even though we're still identifying as the emotion, <laughs> we're coming out of the story where we've maybe were first stuck. <laughs> And then recognizing that there's an emotion happening and that we're identifying with it, right? And then it's this gradual distancing that's able to, to really allow that movement. And even if that movement, like you were talking about, I mean, like it's it, it's gonna be a it, it's gonna be something that's gonna be, you know, looked at again. <laughs> but at least there is a sense of of next step, right? <laughs> I think stepping back, because I think the frustration can cloud and that's the noise in the head, but stepping back through the meditation and reflection, as you said, it's, it's stepping back, distancing myself and being able to see it clearer, what is really going on in that room, because I, I could see myself in the room and her, and then I, I thought, hmm, where is this frustration? So it's that distancing that enables us, for me, enabled me to see the whole picture or a better picture. You know, I'm, I, I want to, I'm really glad you talked about being able to see yourself in the room because I wasn't planning on bringing this element into it, but I think it's a really powerful one. And that is the imagery and what that can tell us as well. And Komal, I remember sharing this with you in a conversation <laughs> that we had, we, Koma, oh, we used to have we will again have these amazing conversations. And I was going through a, a guided meditation and they were asking us to visualize the situation and to actually visualize it. Like as if we were in the interaction with the other person and to zoom in on their face. And, and it was really, really, really powerful. And then I was in a training last weekend. I'd also train as a, um, in somatic experiencing. And they were talking about this model called Saiban. And it's about seeing all the different elements of your experience. So it's sensation, image, behavior, affect, which is emotion and um, meaning. And most of us get stuck in meaning, right? Of course, <laughs> a lot of people coming to coaching, they want meaning, like that's our default. But having the image or having the full experience can bring so much information. So 
I thank you for bringing that up because I think that's a big powerful part of reflection is when we can actually access outside of the meaning that we're making of it, <laughs> you know, see ourselves in the room. Like you said, that's so, that's so powerful. Yeah. That's, that's a very, very interesting point, Tracy. And Eileen, if you may allow me to just reflect a little bit on what you've shared, because that's a very, very powerful question as to whose frustration is this? And you distancing yourself from that feeling sort of allows you to ask this question. And, and if you can just put yourself from in the client's view and say that, okay, if the client is also able to disassociate or distance herself from that sense of frustration, then where would it really be? It wouldn't be yours, it wouldn't be hers, but it would be somewhere in between which you two can come together and say that, okay, so in between, both of you in that space is this restriction and what can be done about it so 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 that's that sort of open up a completely different space in between both of you and thank you for asking that question because that sort of really took me to that 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 is it really belonging to somebody or it's just there And if it doesn't belong to anybody, then do you really need to do anything about it? <laughs> or what do you need to really do about it? Yeah, you know, the naming of it without the attributions, right? The naming without the the, the possessiveness or the, the blame, it takes away the blame or the shame, right? <laughs> then it's just something that exists in between two people. That's really powerful. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about Kolbs. Is everyone, is, is everyone here, is there anyone here that isn't familiar with the, with the Kolbs cycle? Okay. So it's, it's, um, it's a powerful one for reflection. It's a powerful one for experiential learning, <laughs> both of those being kind of the same thing, really. Um, but <clears throat> Uh, let me just pull up. I don't really love slides, but I'll just pull, pull one up for you to see quickly. So that's the cycle. And, uh, and I'm going to take the slide down in a minute, but I just thought you could maybe take a look and, and, and if you wanted to take a note or a screenshot or whatever. Um, but basically what it is, is that we, you know, we, we go out and we have an actual experience, right? And um, inevitably in any experience <laughs> whether we we are consciously learning or not we're learning right there's always a learning to be had you know and and uh if it's not our uh conscious learning then we're creating some level of assumption or something is happening so we're having an experience and then from that experience we are reflecting on the experience right we're actually thinking about um what happened, you know, who I was, or, you know, what, what, what space I was coming from, we're actually looking at that as, as a separate um, thing from the experience. A lot of what we had been sharing about now was reflecting on the experience. And then there's the abstract conceptualization, which is really where we, we think about it, but in, a, you know, in a, in a, in an objective way, right. We start questioning, we actually start like, bringing a little bit of doubt into it, <laughs> questioning what our assumptions are, you know, considering what some of the other perspectives were in this situation, challenging whether or not these beliefs that we had were true. Um, and then we, and then we take all of that and we bring that back into experimentation. So this learning cycle can happen with reflection. It can happen with learning. So like this weekend, this last weekend, I learned about a new model the Saibam model, um, which I'll put in the, in the chat. And then if I consciously take that model and start bringing it into my experience, you know, um, and, 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 and actually being present. So going into that with intention, 
um, and, and looking at ways that I can utilize it. So in a way I kind of did here, I didn't mean to, but something came up for me and I was like, oh, that reminded me of this model. And I shared about it. Right. And then afterwards, looking at what happened, you know, reflecting on it, you know, who, who, what, what energy was I coming from? Who was I in that, you know, as I used this and, and sort of coming up with the thoughts and the feelings around it. And really, I'm going to take this out, really encouraging a, a, a space of acceptance here because this is learning, <laughs> right? So this isn't about, oh, I messed that up. Like I didn't do it properly. <laughs> it's about, you know, um, it's about the, 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 the practice of moving forward, right? Through the cycle, but not the ruminating cycle. Um, and then, and then, yeah. And then the conceptualization and the experimentation, but what I wanted to talk about with the cycle as well is I, I found this amazing, uh, article about how it really integrates well with mindfulness. So we can actually really bring into that concrete experience, that part of us that's out, you know, and about having the experience, a real connection with being present in that moment. So that we're not just like kind of unconsciously going into this experience and then thinking about it afterwards, but actually really like sensing what's happening in our bodies, noticing like, is my pulse picking up here? <laughs> you know, am, am, am I all of a sudden like gripping forward in my seat because I have something that I want to say, <laughs> you know, um, can I feel my feet on the ground, on the ground and, and really just like rooting into the experience because in that sense, the reflection can start happening in that moment. It doesn't need to wait until later. Um, what am I sensing? What am I feeling? What am I thinking? You know, getting a sense of what thoughts are going on in our heads at that moment so that we're not a victim or, or uh, at the mercy of our thoughts, right? But we're just getting a sense of what's happening. And, and then, yeah, and then reflecting afterwards. So, so the reflection can happen in the moment or it can reflect, the reflection can happen after that moment. But like looking at, Again, a sense of objectivity here, you know, um, like, like we talked about even with that situation, kind of looking at the situation as if we're in the room, but we're a fly on the wall. <laughs> and, and what happened in that? What, what was our energy like? What would our body look like? You know, what, 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 what were we feeling? Um, so almost like we're putting ourselves back in the scene, but as an observer, right? And in a sense, that's kind of what we did in that little meditative reflective practice. And then accepting it, accepting whatever it is that's coming up, knowing that we're learning from it, you know. Um, and then the abstract conceptualization, what I really, really liked um, about this article that I was reading was there was a question that came up that we can ask ourselves whenever we start kind of conceptualizing a situation, even our reflections on it, right? Because that's when we kind of go back to making meaning, right? And the question is, is this true? <laughs> and I would love to hear if you could ever with full certainty say yes to that question. <laughs> It really opens up so much information about something when we challenge, is this true? And start looking at what our assumptions are and what, if we, if there was an assumption or if we had a perception, what are the other possibilities for other people's perception, perceptions? What else could have been happening, you know? And then finally, the, the act of experimentation where we start thinking about and this has been a powerful practice for me when I can when I can access it. But a really important part of reflection is the learning, right? So we can reflect and we can reflect and we can reflect, but if we're not actually taking that learning that we have from the reflection, we're always going to have a learning and choosing to do something differently. <laughs> then all we're doing is reflecting on ways that we could um, make different choices and not make them, right? <laughs> 
So one of the most powerful things with experimentation is how could I respond differently in, in, in next time in a way that I would normally not respond? <laughs> What's something that I would do here that it would not like, like, and I thought um, there was a really powerful conversation that I had earlier in, in the group that I was in where someone was talking about perseverance and how per- perseverance is hard work, but on the right path. Right. <laughs> and I thought that's really powerful because you don't want to give up on something, but it doesn't mean that you continue going down the wrong path, right? <laughs> that you continue doing, our, I think our impulse as humans is, I'm going to just keep trying harder, but we keep doing the same thing harder and harder, and it's still not getting us the results that we want. So what could we actually do differently and actually experimenting with that? And that can be applicable in life. I mean, it is applicable in life, but in in our practice and coaching, you know, I've done that a few times when I feel like I've hit a wall with a client. I've just thought, what would I normally not do? (laughs) Like, What approach can I take that's different? Because this isn't, you know, clearly this, this isn't the right path for this client. Tricia, I'd like to add to, um, what you're pointing out and it, and it kind of coincides with, I'm taking a neuroscience uh, program and was just introduced to the model in terms of how the brain uh, really uh, creates meaning or, or emotion, right? And it's it, like the brain's a meaning maker, but the, the model I love because it's how and what happens is it starts with sensory input and sensory could be internal. One of my feelings is my heart rate, pulse going up, is my stomach tightening, am I getting a headache? So internal you know, sensing, it could be external, what am I seeing, that then the brain moves to make a prediction, right? And so the predictions are based on past experience and concepts that we have in the world, right? That then moves to our perception of the experience and perception of um, the experience related to how we feel. Because the what she described is the sensations that we are entered affect mood and affect. The emotion is really our definition of that summary input. So when we get the summary input, we label it with an emotion, which may or may not be accurate. So the model speaks to the importance of doing, um, it's what she refers to as it's a pattern uh, prediction error. So that's where you were saying, stopping, pausing, the prediction error, I call it a pattern interrupt, to be able to say what else might be true? Um, and what what have you considered that could be different? And what might you explore? Which really allows for making a different prediction about what this experience really is or how I really feel, right? So it's about the power of emotion. And, and so I've really been reflecting a lot on the model and, and, and paying attention to I just got certified in positive intelligence and, and, you know, his emphasis in the model is really not spending too much time with the negative emotions. Right. And, you know, kind of the analogy of you put your hand on the stove, once you feel the pain, you remove it. And so that's kind of his emphasis on, you don't have to stay long in your negative emotions. The key is feeling that, but the fact that we're giving meaning to that emotion, right. We're creating the emotion gets back to that. How are we, doing a pattern interrupt, you know, when the prediction error is wrong, right? That we're telling ourselves whether it's a story or we're connecting it to the past experience that may be outdated, right? So it's an old narrative. and old. So it's, for me, even when going through your, your reflection activity, I was really aware of, oh, I don't want to stay in the feeling. Like you were saying, go with the feeling, stay with the feeling, because I've been working hard and no. <laughs> so my, you know, my head was saying, no, 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 I don't, you know, can I, I can shift out of that from the combination of saying, and then we do PQ reps, you know, so you shift your focus, so you can move out of that. Um, and so it's that recognition of the reflection, I think speaks to that period of when you're brain is predicting inaccurate, you know, perceptions of the experience, right? And then labeling the emotions that then we stay stuck with, right? So when we distance ourselves, right, is the, you know, when we reflect and pause, we can distance ourselves from it and say, what else could be true? The experience with Elaine's client, 
Okay, is it her frustration or mine? Who knows, you know, what else could be going on? And what, what might I want to explore rather than maybe staying stuck in the frustration, right? The frustration is the feeling that comes up based upon the label the brain is giving you know, or the meaning. So it's for me that ability to be self-aware and then the ability to then do things differently. So whether you call it, a, you know, interrupting that prediction error, um, doing something to shift the focus away from that bodily sensation. You know, the bodily sensation is what you're paying attention to. Then you just label it, right? You're aware of the bodily sensation. Now, what you label it as, what emotion you give it, again, is you, right? So I just find this whole kind of process of discovery and taking time, but not kind of ruminating on the negative emotion, right? That's the other piece. That's where you can, I think, get caught in this cycle rather than the ability to reflect and shift really is about kind of shifting and saying what you said, what, what other things might be going on or what else could be true or what else might you consider or what, you know, doing a shift in your focus, focusing on your breathing, get into your body. Don't even pay attention to the feeling, but just get into your body. You know, like you did with getting us grounded. Um, anyway, so I'm saying a lot because that's what this is all bringing up and kind of the integration of both that model and then the e, the PQ practice. Thank you so much. That's really amazing. And and you know, I wanted to say like the the exercise that I did. It's it's one that uh, I learned. It, it, it's it's not mine. It's it's one that I. Um, learned from, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar, familiar with Locke Kelly, but he has an amazing, he has an amazing book called uh, Shift into Freedom. And he does a lot of um, glimpse practices for meditation. And I was resistant to it as well in the, when I first tried it, because I have been um, working a lot with trying to sit with emotion as sensation, right? So instead of like the labeling of the emotion, actually really, um, experiencing the energy of it and allowing that energy to move and sometimes even asking questions around the energy. Um, yes, I will put that in the chat. And um, I listened to a talk by a different meditation teacher. His name is uh, Joseph Goldstein. And it was really powerful because he, he addressed that because um it's true. It's like when you label something, you're taking a very complex, it's like taking, it's like taking, calling something a tree, right? Like a tree can mean a bonsai, it can mean a weeping willow, it can mean a pine tree. <laughs> you're taking something so intricate, intricate, and then calling it one thing. And that's like saying sad or happy or angry, right? You're, you're simplifying it. But where the labeling can be helpful is when there's stuckness to realize, oh, this is what I'm identifying with, and then being able to shift. <laughs> so I found that to be helpful in those times, because when I'm able to actually like realize that this is the story I'm telling myself, I'm stuck in this story, and I'm identifying as unhappy or lonely or whatever, you know, it happens to be, then I'm able to start questioning it, like you said, Susan, like then I'm able to kind of break that. But the key is, that you're doing that with the perspective of being able to create that space, right? And being able to um, name it and, 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 and then have it just be a part of the experience that you start questioning as opposed to, you know, what you're walking around wearing. So thank you for sharing that. Um, do you mind putting the name of that model in, in, in the chat? And then I'm just gonna pop in some of what I've been saying. Uh, so Locke Kelly is the name of the, um, I think that's his name, the author. Yeah. And it's shift into freedom. Yeah. Into freedom. And then the model that I was telling you about Saibam is really powerful and it might be, it's good to use with clients. I think it works in a coaching context because when we sense that someone is kind of 
or for ourselves and self self coaching. <laughs> when when someone's stuck in meaning, then we can start exploring other elements of their experience, which are sensations, images, behaviors, affect, and meaning. You know, with both your conversations, Susan and you, Tracy, I've sort of found an answer to, to one of, I mean, I wasn't looking, but somehow I found an answer to something that just automatically happened one day with me, that poetry started to happen. And I think that two very clear distinctions that have come out for me in in this conversation is one, a very clear distinction between ruminating and reflecting. And another is the reacting and reflecting. So right in the moment, instead of being in, in a reactive space, if you are in a reflective space, and when you are outside in a particular situation, when you're not ruminating, but reflecting, and everybody's experience is same that that it opens up space for possibilities. It opens up for something new, which I would say is creativity. So that opens up the space for creativity. And then that creativity can flow either in a poetry or a story or, yeah. So, so that's a very, very clear distinction that has come up for me. <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited as well. That's so true about creativity, right? Like <laughs> when when we when we're actually able to see things <laughs> and 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 then almost like reassemble them in a way, that's creativity. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm aware of our time. Um, I wanted to see does anyone else have any questions or anything that they want to share before we leave this very reflective space <laughs> or take this reflective space away with us, I should say. <laughs> well, I thought maybe we can just try one more thing before we leave. Uh, it'll just be a couple of moments. Um, so it'll be one last activity and then we'll probably have to say goodbye. Um, so coming back into, you know, a comfortable seat and closing the eyes, Finding the feet on the ground, the hands on the body, and just opening up to the sensation of sound. Getting a sense of all the sounds within the experience right now. Maybe that's the sound of my voice, the sound of your breath or heartbeat. the sounds in the household around you or outside the room that you're in. Just opening up to that. Noticing. And then in this field of sound, Noticing as well the sensation of the body. The feeling of where it connects to the seat beneath us. Or even the air as it falls on our upper lip. And just becoming present to the experience of sound and touch. Seeing the dance of light on the back of our eyelids. And then noticing the thoughts that happen to float in and out of the experience. Just sitting here and 
seeing when we first can notice a thought forming. What is the next thought that comes? Notice what happens when the thought becomes noticed. Does it stay? Can you catch it? Can you hold on to it? Perhaps noticing here if the thought can be predicted any more than my voice. Coming in and out of your awareness. Can it be held any longer than sound, I'm just staying here for a moment in silence. Noticing thought. And letting the nervous system know that we'll be coming out of the meditation, maybe taking the hands and rubbing them together or on the knees, feeling the feet on the ground, taking a nice deep breath and getting ready to open our eyes and join each other in the space. In and of our own time. And then just inviting if you feel inclined, there's a couple of minutes that see if you want to catch the experience in writing or in any other way to reflect. Just exploring what happens when we are present to thoughts as an observer versus subject to them. We'll probably have time for one or two shares before we leave each other's company. Did anyone find that there was a different relationship to thought when looking for it as a sensation <laughs> or a part of the experience. I would say when uh, I sense the shift when started to notice the thought itself directly. Then it felt like it's not there. It's sort of vanished very quickly. And as if I'm not able to give a focus on the thought itself, but I'm just caught by the voice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember listening once to someone that was talking about how the experience of noticing thoughts is almost similar to trying to remember a dream <laughs> once the dream has passed. 
Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's something like that, yeah. And so the reason I wanted us to go through this exercise is that, and again, I love this analogy, but I heard this analogy once that our thoughts are like, has anyone here seen that? I'm sure we've all seen the Wizard of Oz, right? <laughs> so, you you know, the wizard, there was all these lights and these ferocious sound and everyone was really, really terrified and thought he was this huge presence. And then you pulled the curtain and it was just this little, little old man. And I, that's what our thoughts are. Like, we believe them to be true. They're so powerful. They can change our entire, they do change our entire lives every minute. But when we actually go and pull the curtain down, they're actually, like, they're nothing. They disappear. So a little reflective um, thing to think leave you with <laughs> reflecting on thought thank you everyone this has been a wonderful wonderful conversation very much needed for me today i appreciate it and i appreciate all of your sharing yeah take care thank you tracy thank you thank you tracy mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Happy reflecting. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been Thank really you. good. Thank you. Thanks, Eileen. It's been great. Thank you, Eileen.